Good morning, Restore Community Church. I'm so glad you tuned in with me today with us here at the Restore Community family. Uh, for those of you that don't know, my name is Dustin Pruitt. It is my privilege to come before you today to kick off a brand new shiny and chrome and sleek and just, it's going to be such a great series, guys, a, a series of knowing God, an intimate, real, factual knowing of God. Um, as you can see, I have my laptop here. This, is, this might be a little bit different uh, for those of you that have tuned in and seen me before. Sometimes I'll merely glance and it, it, I have it so clearly up in my brain, which I'm not saying I don't with this one, but I feel like this is, this is the first of the series. We're, we're laying the table, if you will. And I want to make sure I get everything right. There's, the concepts here are, are somewhat deep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to think. I'm going to ask you to juggle a couple topics at the same time. So if you need a pen and paper, if you need the notes app on your phone out, uh, right now is the time to get it out. I, so I'll be glancing down a little more than you're used to seeing. But that's only because I care. It's only because I want to get it right. Because it's so important to talk about who God is, who Jesus is, without my imperfection getting in the way. So why don't we somewhat dive right in? Uh, and, and I'll dive right in by saying, I, I love my job. I love being a, a minister of the gospel. As we're, we're all ministers of the gospel, but I love doing this. I love meeting with people. You get to meet all kinds of people. Um, I, I remember one time I was giving a message back in America. Uh, and after the service is over, as hopefully we all do when we attend an in-person church service, is we don't rush out the door, we stick around, we have some conversation with people, uh, we have some old, old school fellowship, if you will. And I remember one time I, I was having some fellowship after a service and this lady walks up and she says, hey, can I say something? I just, I would just want to tell you about who I think God is. And I thought, oh, this is my sister in Christ. Maybe she's going to speak on a point that I brought up during the message. And, and yes, and me, which is an improv term of like adding on. And she says, oh, I, I believe God is everywhere and everything. I believe God is the sky. I believe God is the trees, the rocks, the ground, the animals. I think God is us. And I thought, well... Uh, that wasn't what I was expecting, and she, she goes along, that's all, she just wanted to say that, and she went along her day, and I thought, well, um, no, no, uh, God is who he says he is, obviously, right, that's, that's the easy, God is who he says he is, that no one gets to define God except for God, I, I'm, am I blowing your minds yet, guys, is, this, is that too deep for you? And then I got to thinking, later on, this is, this, is, this is at the end of the night, I always kind of look over the day as I lay my head on my pillow at night, and I'm thinking about the message, and I think about afterwards what that lady said. And I thought, God, in some ways, am I just as guilty as that lady? Now, I don't think you're, you're the rocks under my feet, and the trees, and the birds, and what that lady was saying, but are there other moments where I have built a nice shiny and chrome box for you and I, I've smushed you in there to where you fit in a place that I understand, in a place that I'm comfortable with, in a place that I get to control where you are in my life. I get to set you there when I want you there and here when I want you here. Am I just as guilty of that and acknowledge that I've shaped you in the image that I want you to be instead of you shaping me? Am I guilty of thinking that, God, you, you definitely get upset with the things that upset me, but you, you like the things that I like, and, and that the causes that burn with passion in my heart, yours, your heart burns too, and the things that make me uncomfortable, you, you're, you're fine to ignore it just like I am. I, I'm reminded of a quote from Voltaire that said, in the beginning, God created man in his own image. 
and man has been trying to repay the favor ever since. And I think, God, am I just as guilty? There's a, there's a, a popular theologian. Uh, he's also a, an author and a seminary professor. Uh, his name is Scott McKnight. And uh, at the beginning of every semester, he gives his students two surveys. Uh, at the beginning of the class, the beginning of the year, survey number one is he asks the students to list their likes and their dislikes. Their likes and their dislikes. They finish that up. Survey number two pops out. He asks them to list God's likes and God's dislikes. And would you be shocked that 90% of those surveys match completely? That 90% of these kids, now I might have stated that wrong, that 90% of the kids' surveys match completely. That 90% of these students think God is just like them. Now, I'm sure some of you are like fearful, like gripping on, oh, that's the worst thing I could imagine is God being just like a 19-year-old. But here we are. So maybe, maybe we have this tendency of trying to shape God in our image in all of us. And what if we think God is more of a reflection of ourselves than us a reflection of Him? What if there are many ways in my thinking that has been broken, my thinking that about God is off? And to, to be honest with myself, that most of what I pick up about God is from growing up with friends, growing up with family, growing up with the television I watch, the movies I watch, the music I listen to, the, the sermons I've been, a part, like, been witness to. And what if, what if they've been a little off? And listen, I don't, I don't think any of us want to be wrong about God, but, but what if? Now, uh, uh, imagine, if you will, that you're a committed follower of Jesus, which must be a stretch for so many. Or maybe we're just a skeptic with questions here today, which is okay. It is okay to have questions. It is okay to have some skepticism. God is not afraid of that. I'm going to say that from the tip top. I'll say it at the end too. God's not afraid of that. He doesn't want us to shy away. And so if we have these questions, this is a safe place to bring them. That what if we believe about God shapes who we are and how we're going to live day by day because the two sides, if you will, because if God is an unfeeling monster who gives people cancer, who takes away children from their parents, and everything is just supposed to be okay because it's all in his plan. He's got it all figured out. And if this God is all powerful but not actually good and compassionate, then I need to watch out for myself. I need to watch out for number one then. I need to protect mine because no one else will. Or, but, 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 if there's a God who really is, who really is a good shepherd, if I know that there's a God who is my Father in heaven, who cares for me, who's looking out for me, who knows me, every hair on my head, every thought in my brain, every feeling in my heart. If that's true, if that God exists, then I need to know everything I can about Him. Everything that is right and true. I need to know every bit of it. Because if that is true, if I learn, I can rest. It's not so hard. This world's not so hard anymore. It's still hard, but I can rest. I can find strength when I feel so weak. I can find healing when I'm just so sick. And maybe, just maybe, I'll be okay. See, I need to know, 
And I think we all need to know who God really is. So I can know who I really am, and then I can know how to navigate this complicated world. So if I'm going to bank on this God, then I want to make sure I get it right. I want to make sure I get Him right. I want to make sure that I know who He really is. It's not just some figment of my imagination. It's not something that askew. I've I got a piece of it that's clear, but this side's hazy, and I kind of don't under... I want to make sure I get it right. And we're going to look at each of the seven statements, the seven I am statements that occur in the book of John, that this is God saying, Jesus, I am statements. And I think it's going to be absolutely life-changing. In John 6, 35, it says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. So, let's think about Let's take a step backwards. So the series we just came out of, which was Exodus, we, we have made an exodus out of Exodus. So in God, in the very first time, we're, we're back in Exodus, we re-exodized. So when God wanted for the first time to reveal Himself, not just to one person, but to the masses, what did He give them? He gave them Bread. Manna from heaven in the wilderness every day. God gave them bread so that they would know who He is, that He is their provider. And God wanted everyone to remember this big story that He was authoring across all generations that the, the Israelite people, He gave them bread, He gave them a meal, Passover, to remember Him. And, and, and later on, let's fast forward back here, when when Jesus wanted everyone to understand what they were about to witness through His crucifixion, the, the mighty power and miracle, love made manifest, He broke bread at the Last Supper. And in fact, when Jesus was first tested in the wilderness by the enemy, the, that original deceiver, He started with bread, turned these stones into bread. And then all the way at the end, at the book of Revelation, it says, heaven and earth are restored, eternity with this. God of pursuing love will be like bread, like a wedding feast that never ends. Bread is the imagery that Jesus chose to use, and it just kind of, it messed with the heads of people. When, in John 36, and he's like, I am the bread of life. I am, I am a loaf of bread. That's not really like, Jesus, that's not really giving us a lot of confidence on what you just said. And you, you did this mighty miracle, but you're kind of just spouting nonsense right now. It's, it disoriented the followers that they, they thought they had them all figured out. All understood, they, they'd walked with this man day by day. They, they'd broke bread with this man, had meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Did all these things. They thought they knew Jesus. It was the imagery of bread that Jesus used to invite those who were told they were outside the bounds of promise. And in this story, we'll get into that. So if we're going to understand the, the story of Scripture, this one particularly. If you're going to get the life of Jesus and all that He's dragging us into and this miraculous lunch, basically, it was, a, it was a kid's lunch of loaves and fishes in John 6, you're going to have to take a closer look at something that is just as common and ordinary as bread across this globe cultures spanning from east to west, north to south, we've, we all eat bread. And so here we are, we're trying to know God. To become aware of who He is and where, I, I'm confused myself, to become aware of who He is and where He is. 
and what all of this means for me, for you, for us. That God revealed himself first, back in Exodus, first in a burning bush to Moses. Who's Moses saying, what is your name? And God said, I am. Jesus then picked up on that, on that theme and used it all the time. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. In, in fact, John's gospel as a whole literary work is structured around seven signs and seven names that Jesus worked to reveal the identity of God. And that structure wasn't entirely original to God. To John, seven is the Hebrew number of completion. And in the Hebrew Bible, the, the, that Old Testament, today there are seven compound names for God. They, they use seven compound names for God. Yahweh, my healer. Yahweh, my banner. Yahweh, my provider. And so on and so on. That These seven names just added color to the original of Yahweh. And the first of the seven names in the Hebrew Bible is Yahweh Yahir. Now, I, I always thought this was pronounced a different way, but I've, I, I heard it recently pronounced this way, so I've always professed not to be very good when it comes to original pronunciations, and so I don't, I don't want to be horrid, but I've heard it pronounced Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Yahir, but I think that means that's Yehovah Yahir. Please stick with me. I'm going to say Jehovah Jireh. The first seven names means the Lord will provide. And now that, that's kind of a, a, a lazy translation. The actual translation is it the Lord will see to it, which has such a deeper meaning to it just past provider, but that the Lord will see to it. It's a name that makes me think of, of parents. I, I, I think that's easy for anybody to imagine, but it, I'm not a parent, but it makes me think of my parents and maybe my brother, Zach, because my, my brother, Zach, was the first sibling I had. I had just an older sibling at the time, but he's the only one that would kind of freak out. Uh, me and my sister were kind of laid back, um, uh, but Zach would somewhat freak out of certain things that when uh, cookies were made and the last one was on the tray, he'd freak out because this might be the last cookie that's ever baked in the world. So that cookie had so much value that when it, he'd walk into the home and he'd say, Zach, take your shoes off, his shoes would be double knotted so they don't come undone. He can't kick them off because they're stuck to So he'd freak out. It, it would build and build. Or, or my mom would set a bowl of oatmeal in front of him and he'd, but, but I wanted cereal. And he'd have to calm down. My mom would swoop in and say, it's okay. It's okay, Zach. Oatmeal's not, it's, it's good for you. You take it down. And the, it would mean that what is a crisis for him that my mom would enter in on his level, she would become present within it, and then make him feel safe and know that oatmeal is actually okay. That, that's, that, I, that's not actually the last cookie that'll ever be. There'll be more cookies to come, Zach. And that, I think, that impulse to panic uh, isn't unique to him. It's not unique to children even. I think we never really grow out of that. And maybe it's for you, the, the ability to overreact, to lose sleep, to carry anxiety and worry. That I'm talking about worry about, maybe it's not a young child, maybe it's your adult child that you felt you were done worrying about at 28, but now, or at 18, and now they are 28, and you're worrying even more. Maybe it's, it's the worry of there's a new hire in your office, and they're getting looked at for a promotion when you've been there for years and you're not. Maybe it's the investment that you made that's 
actually going sideways. It's going down. Maybe it's the, the, the medical diagnosis that you received that has made your legs buckle and just feel the weight of the world just should that an announcement of death even. Well, I'm here to tell you Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will see to it. I'm not saying that this is going to be a, a, a teaching series that blows your mind. I think this is going to be a, an intellectual exercise, if you will, of the names of God through, through the, the words of John, that it's got everything to do with the here and now. It's got everything to do with your life, with your day job, with your family, with your cares, with your worries. To ask, who is God? And how can I know Him? You can't really stop at the one. You've got to go to the next. How can I know Him? Not in this sanitized, like edges are polished off prettily packaged with a bow on top. But the thick, complex mess of my everyday life to know Him in the here and now. And where you start by knowing is knowing His name. And, and today, the name that we're focusing on is I am the bread of of life. It's, it's one name that I want to, we're going to cut into a couple different scenes here. Um, the, the, the sign, the encore, the bread, the dinner. So here we go. We're, we're going to jump into scene one. So looking back, we're, we're back in John 6. We're going to hop around a lot, but we're going, to, we're going to settle in on John 6 as being the heart of where we are in the Scripture. We're going to go a few other places, but that's where we're going to be. We're in scene one, the sign. So at the beginning of John 6. So the headline before the statement I just read, um, as, as I've started teaching, is Jesus performed arguably, arguably, one of the most well-known miracles to ever exist. That anybody who's cracked open the Bible or is maybe tangentially connected through osmosis has heard about Jesus feeding the 5,000. The, the one that would have... Jesus' most well-known miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, the key verse in this whole story, though, that, that everyone seems to know, the one that would have grabbed attention to every historical Hebrew person reading this, hearing of this story, they were latched on to it, but in our modern context, I think it kind of would float over our heads. And to be honest, it floated over mine. It's only through some, some deep study that I've come across this. Is the Jewish Passover festival was near. Oh, you just think, okay, now I know the, the time of year this is. But to the original Hebrew audience, they, they got it. That little detail Unlock such a greater meeting. So hang on to that. The Passover festival was near. Hang on to that. It goes on to say, when Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. So, so check this out. Jesus intentionally asked the question to one of his disciples as a setup. As a, 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 have you, maybe you've heard of a con man before. It's short for a confidence man. It, he's trying to get somewhere. A con man, he's, maybe he's trying to get into that room and so he'll, he'll charm the people at the door and ask some questions. Jesus is making a setup here because there's something going on. That this is an in, it's not an accident that these people show up and Jesus is like, oh, 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 uh, 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 I'll make bread appear. That's what I'll do. Jesus knows what is about to happen and he's laying the groundwork to let, him know, let all of us know, and the people there at that time, but us here today, that he knew what was about to happen, that it's not out of his control, that it's a miracle that 
points beyond the spectacle of the moment of, oh, 5,000 people with just a few, few loaves and fishes. That it's a sign that points to a person, not to the actual miracle itself. And honestly, it's Jesus' only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all four Gospels. This moment is recorded in there. It's, so it's not a miracle of feeding people. It is Jehovah Jireh saying, I'll see to it. It's that kind of miracle. But this is, it's a sign that means Jesus is up, up to something more than just really good catering, like really efficient catering. Imagine the bill at the end. He fed 5,000. The bill was only four shekels. Can you believe it? Jesus, my man, let's go into business. Wedding season is coming. It's, it's not about that. He, that Jesus is retelling a familiar story to the audience that is there. That He's revealing something that it's been rumored, been whispered about, been hoped for, but it, they're right in the thick of it, right in the complexity of their lives. You see, back in the book of Exodus that we just came from is an equally famous moment that God shows up to an enslaved Israel in need of a rescue. They're, they're enslaved in Egypt. That He reveals Himself in a burning bush to Moses, calling Himself, I Am. Then he works ten plagues, parts the sea, sends bread down from heaven. And then when an invisible but powerful God hears prayers, frees you from enslavement, this is the Israelite story. This is their bread and butter, if you will. And so what does God give them to remember such a monumental time of transition for the Israelite people from bondage to freedom, God gives them a meal. He gives them Passover. He, a way to taste of the bread, the, the unleavened bread, which is part of the story. They didn't have time for the bread to rise, so they just baked it as quickly as possible. This unleavened bread to recall the signs that pointed beyond the Israelites, but to the person of God. Now, here we are in John chapter 6. The Israelites are once again underneath the boot of another people. This time it's the Romans. And they were crying out to God again for another liberator. Can we, God, can we have another Moses? My, he might have not been in the best thing, but he was so good. Can we get another, just one more? We don't even need Aaron. Can we just get another Moses? And so one of the signs they were looking out for of this new Moses, this new rescuer, the Savior, was manna from heaven, which was bread from heaven, just like it was in the book of Exodus. That he will give us bread in the wilderness today, just like we've heard he did back when he spread a Passover table before us. Once again, John chapter 6, verse 4, here at the very beginning, the Jewish Passover festival was near. Right, let's unlock that phrase again. It's where our story begins. I, Jesus, just like Moses, then gives them bread in the wilderness. So, so follow along with me. Let's jump down to verse 12. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them 12 baskets full. Not, not 11, not 13, not 10, not 9, but, but 12. Now why 12? It was never about the leftovers. It wasn't about the, the doggy bag, the, the take home, the seconds the day after. It was never about the food. It was about what the 12 baskets represent 
of the 12 tribes of Israel. That everybody in that crowd, every Israelite in that crowd has that drilled into their head, the 12 tribes. The 12 tribes. And so Jesus before them with 12 full baskets of food is a reminder and that they would know exactly where the miracle is pointing. Verse 14, all the people saw the sign Jesus performed and they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. The prophet, the promised Savior, the one who will liberate us again like he did. Then the one who will give us bread in the wilderness. And they're like, could this... Could this be the guy that has been talked about for so long, centuries now? Could this really be the guy? It sounds like the guy. It's, it's doing the thing the guy does. But we're really just getting started. Here we are in scene two, the encore, if you will. Um, if, you, if you can switch gears with me, the psychology department at Princeton University, which is one of the better universities in America, uh, used to conduct one experiment on every single one of their students. They had, they had a student go through, there's a door into a room, so maybe I'll have the room over there. There's, there's a door here, there's a room on the other side, and there's a little hole that they can look through. They had the students say, there's something on the pedestal in the room, can you look at it and tell us what it is? And so they'd walk up and they'd put their, their little eye to the door and Take a, take a peek, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, there's, there's a box on the pedestal. And the, the professors would ask, did you notice anything else about the room? They go, uh, no, no. And really when the, the ceilings were like a 45 degree angle this way, the floor was at a 30 degree angle this way, the walls was like a trapezoid, it wasn't a square room, all these things were off. But they, when they were told to see something, they only saw that one thing. And it's just, they weren't told to look for it. And sometimes I think when we're told to look for and see it, and we can see it really well, we fail to see the surrounding and so what, what, is, what does that mean? Where am I going with this? And so we're looking at the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, saying, I am the bread of life. But we got to look at the surrounding to see the full, beautiful picture and meaning that God is trying to show in this story. And it's not just about feeding people. It's not just about leftovers. There's so much more there. So in Matthew's gospel, when it's talking about the feeding of the 5,000, it's followed by a nearly identical miracle of feeding of 4,000. 5,000, 4,000. And there's a couple things that happen in between. And, and this is called a, a, uh, a marking passage. So imagine, if you will, let's, let's take a, a walk in our mind. Imagine a sandwich. What, you're probably thinking I'm going way off topic here. Imagine a sandwich, if you will. What is your perfect sandwich? My, my perfect sandwich, if I can describe it to you, is a, a pastrami Reuben. That's a rye bread, a provolone cheese, sauerkraut, Thousand Island dressing, pastrami, thick slice, like brisket sliced, a slice of rye bread on the bottom. Delicious. It's almost the price I wouldn't pay to have that here in London. Uh, I miss it so much. But a, a pastrami Reuben. So this marking sandwich that we have here right now, and it, in Matthew's Gospel, it's so clear what's going on. These two parallel stories. So let's, let's take a look at it. Let's, let's, let's go into it, if you will. If you really want to grasp everything that God is laying out, that Jesus is laying out here, the, the whole purpose of being bread, the whole purpose of who God is, you've got to take a bite into the sandwich. That you can't just take feeding the 5,000. You can't just take 
the storm walking on the water. You can't just take the next story, the next story, and then the feeding of the 4,000. You can't just take one piece out. You don't need a sandwich. Take the bread, then you take the cheese and eat it. Then you take the lettuce, and then you take the meat, and then you take the last piece. You take a whole bite of the whole thing. So that's what we're about to get into here. So Jesus feeds the 5,000, collects the 12 baskets full. The 12 tribes of Israel, point landed. They get it. Next, Jesus walks on water. So immediately after feeding them, Jesus tells his disciples to get into a boat. He's going to dismiss the crowds. Hey, go, everyone go back home. Uh, have a good day. We'll catch up later. And he walks out on the water uh, to the boat, catching up with his disciples. And the disciples are freaking out. They are having a bad time out on that water. And they're in the midst of a violent storm. Winds, waves are kicking up all over the place. And Jesus shows up to them. They saw the sign of the miracle, but they missed the person behind it. I, I can go into so much about each individual ingredient here, but let's just take a bite, if you will. The miracle, the person that the miracle is pointing to is Yahweh is near, that the Lord will see to it, that the provider will take care of you. Hey, you guys are worrying on this boat? It's fine. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will see to it. It doesn't matter how big the waves are. It doesn't matter how fast the winds are blowing, uh, lightning come. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will see to it. And it's great for me to see, say this, and it's great for many pastors to say this, many people to say this, say the Lord will see, the Lord's your provider. The Lord will see to it. But it's really hard when you're down and you need provision. It's hard to ask God for power when you're powerless. Isn't that strange? It's easy to, when we have stuff, to have more. We want more. But when we have nothing, when we feel alone, I feel like that's when we have the tendency to kick and to scream and to grounce it, grasp at any ounce of control. It's hard to give that up to God and say, God, will you be my provider? Not me. Will you be my provider when I'm at my last inch? Second part, the second slice of our sandwich, the second ingredient in our sandwich here is that Jesus has a disagreement with some priests about purity and, and the meaning therein and who's pure, who's not pure. Um, and the, the priests are convinced that spiritual purity comes down to eating and drinking, avoiding the wrong things, consuming the right things. And Jesus essentially says, you've got it fully backwards. It's what comes out of your mouth, not what goes in, that makes you spiritually unclean. Third part of the sandwich here comes the faith of a Canaanite woman. Now, we're, we're going we're gonna to expound on this one a little bit more than the others. That Jesus goes directly from a public disagreement about the spiritual purity of people to an encounter with someone who would be considered the most spiritually impure person to the Israelites. She, this is a woman from Canaan. This is a Canaanite woman. These were the ethnic enemies of the Jews. They were born at the, the bottom rung, as far as, as far as Israelites were concerned. They're, they're the lowest of the low. There's so much history there. that The Canaanites were the very people occupying the promised land that, the, that in the book of Exodus, the Israelites were trying to get into. They are a constant threat to the spiritual purity of Israel. In the book of Deuteronomy, the Canaanites are referred to as the seven nations. Hold on to that real quickly. The Canaanites are the seven nations. In the scripture, it says, the woman came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. He replies, it is not... Sorry, let me, let me get this right. Uh, this woman, 
goes to him and says, Lord, help me. He replied, is it not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs? Whew, this is... Now dogs in, in, in the Israelite ancient religion, dogs would make you unclean. Dogs were an unclean animal. They would make you unclean. So it, it was a common racial slur for an Israelite to call a Canaanite dog. You impure thing. You unclean thing. And so Jesus, is he, did he just say the cruelest thing he could say to this woman? Is it not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs? Why should I heal your child, dog? You thing? Which... It, it blows my mind. And it goes on to say, she, I should say, she goes on to say, yes it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Jesus replied with, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed in that moment. That the, Jesus calls her faith great. Nowhere else, nowhere else in the entire Gospel of Matthew is anyone else's faith called great. Then comes the third ingredient to our sandwich here, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this expounding because uh, it is a poison later. It says it's the story of a Canaanite woman um, who, at that day and age, Jesus had just come from this disagreement about the the what makes people pure, spiritual purity, and he shows up and boom, a Canaanite woman. The Canaanites are the 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 ethnic enemies of the Jews historically for years and years and years. Canaanites are the lowest of the low as far as Israelites are concerned. They're the scum of the earth. Um, that, that way back in the book of Exodus that the Canaanites, or I'm sorry, in the book of Deuteronomy, no, I'm sorry, that in the book of Exodus, in, in the, the promised land, the Canaanites were there before the Israelites. They're, they're ancient enemies here seen as unclean there's tons and tons of history and in the book of Deuteronomy the Canaanites are referred to as the seven nations hold on to that real quick seven nations and it says here the woman came and knelt before him Lord help me she said this is about her her child is sick she's she's asking for a miracle from God and he replies is it not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs? Jesus is just, you don't know, he's laying down terrible language. Dogs were an unclean animal according to the purity rights Jesus just debated about, that just disagreed with. And to call, it was common to call Gentiles dogs. You unclean, you impure things thing, you dog. And this lady comes up and it sounds like Jesus just used an ethnic slur against this lady. And I'm like, Jesus, this isn't, this isn't the Jesus that fits in my nice box. What's going on? But he's not doing it to offend this woman. There's, there's something else going on here. He's doing it to heal the woman's daughter and to teach the disciples listening. She replies to Jesus and says, Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to the woman, You have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter healed in a moment. That Jesus calls her faith great. Nowhere else in the Gospel of Matthew, is anybody's faith called great? That is, this high praise, the highest praise, 
is given to a person, arguably the highest praise Jesus gives to any person in all of his life and ministry is directed to arguably the lowest of the low person, spiritually and socially the most marginalized, she gets to be called great. Her faith is great. However rude we think Jesus is at the beginning of the story, he is unquestionably honoring there at the end. Unquestionably honoring. And then Jesus gives her the bread of life, heals her daughter in a moment. So that's the, that, that's the middle of the sandwich. Now we're here at the bottom, the feeding of the 4,000. And it's kind of an identical scene that we saw at the top sandwich, the top of the bread, the bread at the top of the sandwich. The, the crowds are following as he teaches. He, he's teaching the masses. He's healing the sick. Jesus is doing Jesus things. The day is drawing to a close. He's in a remote place and there's nothing to eat. So Jesus asks his, his disciples if they've got anything. And would you believe it? They've got the equivalent of a child's lunch. They got, they got this much. They got just a, a, a peck of food. It's an identical scene, except there's the difference is Jesus has crossed the lake now. Here he is in the region of Tyre and Sidon. He is in Gentile territory. Before feeding the 5,000, he's with the Israelites. He's in Israelite territory. He's in home ground. He's crossed the lake. He's now in Gentile territory. He is in spiritually impure lands. The people gathered on the mountainside, they're hungry for something more. And Jesus is surrounded by a massive crowd of people, considered second class citizens to Israelites, second class, low class, low born, nothing, dogs. And Jesus does the same miracle. He does the same sign. He told the crowd to sit down. He took the seven loaves. He took the fish. When he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied afterwards. And afterwards, the disciples picked up. Guys, would you believe it? The disciples picked up seven baskets in the, in the, the Israelite territory. They collected 12, showing that Jehovah Jireh will provide for the 12 nations of Israel. And here we are in Gentile territory. They collect seven baskets. Seven, once again, the Hebrew number of completion. Seven baskets for all nations. Do you see it, guys? Do you see what Jesus was showing them and ultimately us? That they got in a, in a flash. Their minds were blown wide open. That do you see the person that the miracle is pointing towards? That Jesus is saying, I am Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh to see to it, that I will see that I'm the provider of all of Israel in all of the seven nations, the rest of the world. I am the bread of life for all people, not just the, the privileged Israelites, but for all. I'm the one who gives life not just to the carriers of the promise, the descendants of the Israelites from Exodus, but to every last one of the most forgotten, most marginalized, most distrusted, most unqualified, outsiders, that I have a place of honor for you at my table. That's what Jesus is saying. Where others would scoff and kick dirt at you, you get a place of honor at my table. And you see these two miracles in connection when you've put that sandwich together and taken a bite. 
I hope you're tracking with me. I'm laying a lot out on the table. I'm coming to a close here. Scene three, the bread. So we're back in John chapter six. I'm going to pick up in verse 25. It says, when they found him on the other side of the leg, they asked him, I'm sorry, they're like, they asked him, Rabbi, Jesus, yo, yo, when did you get here? So Jesus gives bread to the wilderness and he performs miracles, crossing, a miraculous crossing of water. And surely, this is tickling their memory of all these stories they've heard of their forefathers and what they went through and of the Torah and what's in there, the book of Exodus and what's going on, crossing water and giving bread. Jesus is doing that. Jesus answers them and says, Very truly I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Boom, you're dazzled. Oh, my man, I just performed a magic trick and you guys can't wrap your heads around it. You want to see another. You are, your belly is full. You're feeling good. You just want to chase that experience, my man. That you tasted it and it widened your eyes for a moment. You wonder, but did you see the person behind the miracle? For us, do we see the person behind the feeling, behind the word, behind whatever it is for us? Are we chasing the feeling? Are we chasing the moment? To go on, it says, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you from Him, the Father has placed His seal of approval. We're going to jump down to verse 30. It says, So they asked Him, All right, all right, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe in you? What will you do? What a gauntlet to throw down. What will you do? That our answer, I'm sure in their mind, their answer, and bleh, in their minds, they're thinking, our ancestors, they ate manna in the wilderness. As it's written, he gave bread from heaven to eat. Moses gave us bread. He gave us bread. Je- Moses, Jesus, they both gave us bread. And he didn't just give it to us once. He gave us to us day after day. And we've been waiting for a Savior, asking for another Moses to come free us, lead us to freedom again. Jesus, are you the one? Are you the one? What will you do to show us? Are you the one? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is saying, no, you guys, you're missing it. Moses didn't give you that bread. What are you asking for Moses for? What do you want Moses for? Why are you trying to get the middleman? Moses was just a middleman. Why don't you go to God? Seek after God. That my Father in heaven was sending you the bread in the wilderness. Then Jesus declared, they said, and then Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. That the I am, the person that these miracles, that the bread, that the meals are pointing to, is Jesus. It's not the moment. It's not the moment of the miracle. It's what the miracle points to. Jesus. At verse 41, at this, the Jews there began to grumble because they heard him say, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They're, they're, they're starting to freak out. Right, they're just bar none. They're, they're not having a good time anymore. Jesus is right. They wanted the miracle. They wanted the moment. Jesus, I followed you out here to this mountain because I want to feel warm and fuzzy again. I want to feel good again. I want my belly to be full again. But you're saying all this other stuff now. And I'm not jiving with it, my man. It is not going down smooth. We're going to jump 
to verse 53 now, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you will have no life. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. You will have true life if you take my life. That it's such a beautiful exchange that my righteousness for your failure, my wisdom for your folly, my love for your hate, my innocence for your guilt, my resurrection for your death. And I can't help but think, Jesus, why didn't you say it like that? Why didn't you just say, my righteousness for your failure, my wisdom for your follow up? Why didn't you say, it like, why did you say, eat my flesh and drink my blood? If we jump down to verse 66, it says, Now from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And I'm like, Jesus, my man, if you just put it my way, that whole exchange bit, if you'd said it like that, Jesus, none of those guys would have stopped. You, it would have worked out fine. Why did you say it like that? Because that, you're asking these people, these thousands of people to become cannibals? Jesus, are you asking me to become a cannibal? Because I'm not okay with that. To, so much so that, that blood would make you unclean in, in the, the Israelite religion at that time. In Judaism, you'd become unclean, just blood. And here you are telling me to have a glass. What is going on that you would lose thousands of people over a misconception? God, couldn't you have been clearer? Take my advice. Be a little clearer next time. Yeah. But if you go down deeper, you begin to see what he is doing, just like the story of the Canaanite woman calling her a dog. It might seem to offend, but the healing, the bread is coming after. He says these things on purpose. It's not a mistake. The offense, all those purity laws about blood coming in contact with blood, those laws are rooted deep in the Mosaic Covenant of the, of the Old Testament. That the, the very first bread miracle is pulling from that time, Mosaic Covenant, Moses. That first story of bread, he's pulling from that. And then remember the middle of the sandwich. Jesus had a disagreement with priests and with purity laws. So Jesus says, drink my blood. Then you will get the freedom and the life you're after. And that is the only way Jesus had a different definition of purity. One that was going to expand the family of God. But in order to expand the family first, he would have to offend those who thought they knew the boundary, who thought they had it figured out. God's in this beautiful, shiny chrome box with a bow. I get it. I understand. Jesus, why are you poking out the side? You ripped it. Je Jesus, you ripped the box. He first had to offend. He says, I am the bread of life. That I am the person that this invitation that he's offering will be so clear who people that look at it and see it and hold in. But in this moment, it's a, I, ooh, I don't, ooh, I, uh, it's a wince and look away. I'm not sure I can, Jesus, I was, we were vibing before, but I'm not really okay with that. Can we shave that off? Can we just like, can I, there, can I have that Bible real quick? Can we just rip that paper out and I'll put it over there. Oh, it's a beautiful Bible again. Oh, I love it. It's a wince and look away. So let's kind of, let's go a little deeper on it. Can we go a little deeper on that? I've, we've been so long. I'm so sorry, but I'm so into what the, this Jesus is saying here in this text. So please stick with me as we're, we're coming in for a landing. Did you know that human body can't process raw wheat? 
We can eat bread for days, but if you eat more than, you know, an eighth of a handful, you'll vomit of raw wheat. Our bodies just can't handle it. If we, if we try to live off wheat, we could get this far and nothing would happen. But when we're ground it down into flour, bake it into bread, it's life-giving. It's life-giving. In order for wheat, the raw materials, to become bread, the world's most common, it's, remember, east to west, north to south, cultures all over eat bread. It has to be processed. And this word from Jesus, I am the bread of life, needed and needs to be processed. Only later in the full context and understanding of who Jesus is, the, the history He's speaking to, and the future He's speaking to, do the signs point that this hard saying that offends becomes breathtakingly beautiful. That it becomes a promise that the principle behind the offense, that sometimes, sometimes a word from God comes and it doesn't feel good. Sometimes we read something in the Bible, and, oh, that's getting caught in my throat. That is not, oh, that's not easy to go down. You hear a word from the Lord and you're like, I, God, you missed the mark on that one, my man. That Jesus, I love, so, I love some of the stuff you're saying. I love your take on the poor, but if you got money, what's your beef, Jesus? Why do you got beef with people with money? That Jesus, I love the open invitation that all nations, not just the Israelites, but all nations, you're going to be the bread of life too, but you come really restrictive in the way people get to heaven, the way people get to God. Why, why are you so open over here and you're so narrow here? I don't get it. I mean, one side of the coin is broad and pluralistic and the other side seems so, ex so exclusive. That Jesus, I love ooh, ooh, the way you opened that sermon on the mount with the Beatitudes. My man, you were just, that is some poetry going on, but you, you so quickly drunk, jump to, to sexual ethics that it's... it's that in my circumstances, my context, the world I'm living in, it doesn't, my man, it just doesn't work. Jesus, that doesn't work in today's day and age. That I'm trying to kneel, and it's just like nails on a chalkboard. It's something caught in, <coughs> caught in your throat. It is just not going down right. It's a wince. I don't, I don't know about that. And you just kind of, you take a step back. that people often hear from God and don't stick around for the processing. That Jesus didn't come to reveal a God we can perfectly understand, but one that we can perfectly trust. We don't have all the information right now. Jesus just told us to eat his body and drink his blood. They didn't have all the information yet. But once they did, And the way you deal with that, 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 oh, I don't, oh, I don't know, is to not do this, to not back away. Jesus is wanting us, God, the bread of life is wanting us to stay and digest. To stay and process that wheat that he gave us so that it can become the bread of life. You know, saying doesn't mean you'll immediately get the answer. We, we don't go to the people to help the process, but so, I'm, I'm sorry, so often we don't go to people wanting help with the process. We go to people because we want to hear them say the same things I've been thinking. You know what? That is right. They're not, they're not acting right over at Albany. You know what? What they're doing at Epping is a problem. I'm glad you agree with me that I, I, I found you. 
I looked for you and oh, I found you. So often we're not looking to process, we're looking to echo one another. We don't let that raw word, that, that raw thing that God showed us in the Bible or spoke to us, process and turn into bread. And here we are at the landing. At Luke 22, starting in verse 14, it says, Jesus is saying, I'm sorry, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Can I tell you, in a recent sociological study that went out, there's three phrases that are the top three that bring the most joy to people when they hear them. Number one, I love you. I love you brings the most joy to a person when they hear it. Number two, I forgive you. And when people are forgiven, it brings them such great joy, second only to being loved. Third, dinner's ready. (laughs) Dinner's ready. Can you believe it? But I think that's so so spot on kind of for the ministry of Jesus that he's come down and says, I love you. You are forgiven. Come to the table. Dinner is ready. I am the bread of life ready for you. I just, my mind gets blown away by that. That I, Jesus saying, I've eagerly, in the scripture, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. That this table, Jesus has said, is where I'm trying to get to. This is the place I want to be, Jesus is saying, is with you. Sharing that meal of one another, sharing myself with you. That this table is where sinners find Christ where sons and daughters celebrate being found that instead of we just come and praise the God of bread that we shouldn't we should sing that we are born again to know that maybe we should tell these stories about going home That Jesus found me. Jesus found me. I'm getting excited to just thinking about my own testimony of the death and and miry clay that Jesus brought me up out of. I'm getting excited just now thinking about it. That who is God? How can I know Him? And not the sanitized, what I think should be is I don't rip that page out of the Bible because I don't like the way it makes me feel. But to take in the Word and process it. The how can I know Him? The, the disappointment I feel and the confusion I face, the thing that He says, that God says, that the Bible says, it turns my stomach in that pit and it just doesn't that when I think about the situation, how can I know Him in the real life I'm living in? Know Him by His name as the bread of life. Jesus just didn't come for the few. He came for all. Jesus didn't come to to please the masses. Like my little brother fussing that he got oatmeal instead of cereal. Jesus came to give us exactly what we needed, even if we didn't know it. And sometimes, that's going to be a tough pill to swallow. That's going to be a tough thing to hear. It's going to be a tough thing to internalize. Jesus, this is who you actually are? 
Not who I think you are, but who you are. So when that happens, don't, don't pull away. Know who God really is. Jehovah Jireh, the God who will see to it. There's an issue, Jehovah Jireh. God will see to it. There's a fear. Financial burden. Family burden. Death. Disease is looming. Jehovah Jireh. God will see to it if we stick and process and not push away, not wince. So why don't we pray? God, we thank You so much for who You are. We thank You so much for all of this. Boy, is it a lot. But boy, is it so important to show Your character that You don't say things on accident, that You plan ahead, and that You provide. God, I thank You so much for the who You truly are, not just who I think You are. If You were the the Jesus of Dustin's mind, how small you would be. But you are so much greater. Father, and I thank you for that. We thank you for that. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you so much for sticking with me, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it, it made as much sense to you as it did to me. And I feel like it's so, it was long. I get it. It was long. Who cares? God cares. I care. I hope you care. And I hope you take this and don't let it go in one ear and out the other, but let it bang around in your head. Let it echo in your heart. And we'll see you next week. Bye, guys.